Well, hello there. This is Christopher of the Exorcism Team for the Lighthouse Church, and I wanted to bring you a special teaching. Um, this is a compilation of some notes that I've taken over the years. Um, some of them are me, some of them are my experiences, some of them are notes from Bob Larson's DVD, Inner Healings versus Demonization. Um, a lot of people do not understand uh, the concept that there are people who have chemical imbalances um, and there are people who have demons who mimic those chemical imbalances. So it really is becomes a fine line between uh, discerning whether you're actually dealing with something who has someone who has a medical condition or someone who is being demonized. And I will be the first to admit that the church does a very bad job at discerning what's really going on. And sometimes we put people through deliverance who have a medical issue and they really need to get that medical issue taken care of. Um, we'll be the first to admit that doctors don't know everything, but this is what they get paid to do. And any of this information that I'm presenting for us right now is not medical in nature. This is just experiential. Um, we will be the first ones to tell you that if you have been prescribed a medication from a licensed professional, you need to take that medication from the licensed prof professional. We will never tell you to take, stop taking your medicine. If you wanna stop taking your medicine, you need to have that licensed professional wean you off of it. I hope I'm, I'm clear and understanding. Mental illness is a very tough subject in the church because you cannot run away from these people. They're there. They're God's people too. And they need ministry. They need deliverance. They need help as well. But it takes a special understanding in order to be able to really minister to them in the way that they need. And you have to be a super saint enough to know that sometimes you can't do anything. And I know we, we want to jump in there, put our big S's on our chest and say, we're going to save the day. Sometimes it's beyond your ability to do. And you need to be honest with the family that you're dealing with. You need to be honest with the person. Hey, nothing we can do. We have been... Had, had, had to have been honest with people and tell them we've reached a point where there's nothing that we in our, in our own selves can do. And we've had to refer them out to other ministries, refer them to other places. You know, I mean, I'm talking about hours upon hours of deliverance, hours upon hours of talking and counseling and things like that. So if you're in this exorcism and you're, you know, you're trying to help people, you got to realize that this is an area that requires a great sensitivity, but it also requires a great uh, anointing to be able to weed through whether you're dealing with a person or a spirit or a spirit inside of that person. So in today's environment of super saints, there's a tendency to overlook the practical needs associated with being human. If you don't eat, drink water, sleep, use the bathroom, you will die. You just will. This is a medical fact that I don't believe the super saints really take into account. These super saints never get tired. They never wear out. They never eat and they never use the bathroom. Secretly, they're dying on the inside, but their spiritual pride will never allow them to say this to you. These same super saints will also tell you that nothing ever bothers them. They can minister for hours upon end and it doesn't drain them physically. They can answer the phone call after phone call from the same person with the same problem repeatedly in a 24 hour cycle. And they just smile and say, Jesus loves you and expect you to believe that it doesn't matter to them. I'm not so naive. You can tell me with your mouth but I also see what you do when no one else is looking at you. It's just the reality. 
Let me be just real with you. You are living in an illusion, a fantasy that one day will break down and you will find yourself on the receiving end of some stern chastisement from the Father. We need to look at Jesus as our example always, always. And I, he probably noticed these crutches back here behind me. I fell. I, I missed my missed three steps and I'm bruised. I'm bruised and I'm hurting. Um, I went to the doctor. So I believe that you need to do what's necessary medically in order to take care of yourself. Um, hopefully everything will work itself out. But right now, <laughs> I'm not, not doing good. <laughs> so please keep me in your prayers. So we need to look at Jesus as our example. The very first thing that I like to point out to super saints is that Jesus had a doctor on his team. He just he had a doctor on his team. Let's take a quick peek at Luke. Luke was a physician. He used a medical vocabulary instinctively. In the incident where the boy is said to be thrown down, English text, by his affliction, the Greek word Luke uses was the current medical term for convulsions. In the incident where the distraught father cried to Jesus, look upon my son, the word Luke uses for look upon is the current medical term used of a physician seeing a patient. Like most physicians, Luke was understandably defensive of the medical profession. When the hemorrhagic woman approaches Jesus, Matthew and Mark tell us she had exhausted all her savings on physicians, but was no better. Dr. Luke tells us the same story, but chooses to omit the part about costly medical treatment that is proved ineffective. As a travel companion to Paul, Luke got to meet the leaders of the young church, Peter, Barnabas, Stephen, Lydia. But Paul was his special friend, his bosom friend. And to his friend, Luke remained undeflectably loyal. Paul was his special friend, his bosom friend. And to his friend, Luke remained undeflectably loyal. How loyal? When Paul was imprisoned in Rome, and his execution was imminent, Paul wrote young Timothy, Luke alone is with me. He couldn't have been more loyal. My point, if Jesus was not afraid of the medical profession of his time, why should we be? Does the truth that Jesus was not afraid of the medical profession of his time discount the miracles that Jesus performed? Absolutely not. Does the truth that Jesus is still not afraid of the medical profession of our time stop him from performing miracles in our day? No, it does not. So it will be important for you to re-examine your doctrine, Mr. Super Saint, Mrs. Super Saint. Were there some crackpot doctors in Jesus' day? Absolutely. We know that there are crackpot doctors today. There is nothing new under the sun, saints. Nothing new. Let's get this thing totally right and stop wasting time arguing over who has enough faith for a miracle or to be healed or delivered. We forget one important ingredient in miracles. If God doesn't want it done, it's not going to happen. If God doesn't want it done, it's not going to happen. My second point is, and I hope you understand this and you get this deep into your spirit. Jesus himself suffered great mental anguish. Great mental anguish. Matthew 26, 36 to 46. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed saying, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were very heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. If Jesus could suffer such a terrible state of mind, is it possible to consider that a spirit tormented him? Is it possible to think that his chemicals in his brain could have been off? You make that decision for yourself. The Bible says that he was touched in every way that we were touched. Hebrews 4.15 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Think about that. There are many in the body of Christ who have infirmities of the mind, body, and soul. Does that make them any less of a child of God? No. They still need love. They still need Jesus. They still need to have their basic needs cared for and attended to by the body of Christ. So when you're dealing with demons or mental illness, Bob Larson has some things that he likes to do that I encourage you to do as checks and as ways to figure out what's really going on. If you don't get a direct word, from the Holy Spirit, these are some very good things to do and to keep in the back of your mind when you're trying to determine what's really going on. Bob Larson says, what are some clues to determine if, if it's the chicken or the egg, the devil or the mind? If it's true mental illness, there are some things that are very obvious and will clue you into this possibility. Now, this does not dismiss the possibility of demonization. Things to check. Family history. Could it be a family curse and that has to be looked at, but it can also be something that is congenital. The person is born with this. It's inherited through the family line. Now, this does lend to some legitimacy to the fact that this is a chemical, hormonal, physiological, psychological event that's taking place in a person that is being transferred from generation to generation. So what Bob Larson is saying here is, you need to ask and inquire about the family history involved with the person that you're doing an exorcism on, or you need to take a look at your own family history to determine, hey, has anybody else in my family encountered the problems that I'm encountering? And if you do, and you, and you see that, that's a clue that not everything that you're going through is demonization, all right? Second thing to check, institutionalization as a result of a legitimate professional diagnosis. So we should approach this a little more cautiously in terms of demonization. So if you have been institutionalized because a professional, deem that you needed to be institutionalized, we have to look at this with a different set of eyes, a different set of lenses. We should approach this a little more cautiously in terms of demonization. Assuming the diagnosis is legitimate and the person is qualified and they have genuinely tried to determine the mental state of the individual. Now, I wanna cite here that there's a gentleman that lives up in Newark, Delaware. His name is Gary Whetstone. Gary Whetstone was diagnosed to be mentally ill. He was institutionalized. He was locked away, was never, ever going to get out. 
a man of God reached out to him, ministered to him, and long story short, he has a couple of churches that he's 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 uh, running and administering for the Lord. Had it not been for the intervention of God, restoring his mind, bringing him back into the right place, and in his own words, removing the demons from him, he would be in that institution today. So even with everything that I've just said about institutionalization and professionals, you still need to check and see if what's going on is a demon. We know that there are cases where people have been classified and institutionalized by legitimate professionals, professionals and there was nothing wrong with them but demonization. Set them free from the demons and they're fine. Whenever you have positive confirmation of the institutionalization, approach them with caution. We, as exorcism and deliverance ministers, never want to be at odds legally or professionally with the mental health community. You can get yourself in big trouble. And again, please don't ever tell anyone to stop taking their medications. You can suggest to them to go see their doctor and have them weaned off. But don't ever, don't ever tell them, stop taking that medication. You will get yourself in serious trouble. You can get yourself into a whole lot of trouble. You may suspect a bad diagnosis because there are some lazy clinicians who are all too ready to write a prescription because they don't want to take the time to work with the person. But <clears throat> you need to be careful when you're dealing with this particular subject because it's very, very touchy. You can't work this into a 50-minute, $300 session. However, there are some good clinicians who will try to help the person who is demon-possessed. Symptoms. This is another area that you have to look at and investigate to see. Is this possibly, you know, what Bob Larson says, the chicken or the egg? Is this, is this demonization or is this just a person's mind? So the question that he asks, are the symptoms consistent? When the symptoms are consistent, that points more in the direction of mental illness. When the symptoms are almost always there and there is very little lucidity, meaning the person is out of touch with reality more than they are in touch with reality, that tends to indicate mental illness. When it's demonization, it's more of the effect of the demon causing them to have aberrations or psychologically periodic basis of not being in reality. So you have to be careful to discern what's really going on. When, there's, when there is a period where this person is in and out of reality, that can indicate demonization. When there's a period when the person is in and out of reality, that can indicate that it's demonization, not mental illness. King Saul is an excellent example of this. He was fine most of the time until the evil spirit from the Lord would come upon him and then he would go into fits of depression, or we would call this today bipolar disorder. All right, so the next thing that you look for is religion. Is there a preoccupation with religion or the mental aberration expresses itself with thoughts of blasphemy, religious preoccupations, things with a very anti-God in nature characteristic. This person may have a religious psychosis. And sometimes you would be amazed at how difficult it is to discern whether this is actually a demonic spirit or this is a part of the person's mental illness where they are fixated on religion. This does happen. This is something that's completely beyond their control. They can't make this stop happening. They can't stop thinking about hell. They can't stop thinking about uh, demons and, and different things that, that keep them bent in a place of not being in, in this world, in this reality that we live in day in and day out. 
So if there's that preoccupation with religion, you know, you can't go to the bathroom without reading the scripture or you can't walk down the street. You know, this is why the religious spirit is so, so dangerous because that religious spirit is masking someone's mental illness. And you have to be very wise and discerning as to, to know what's going on. So there, there are people who are psychotic, who are religiously psychotic. They don't think that they are Napoleon. They think they are God. If the person has a religious preoccupation, it may be demonic because normally a person who is mentally ill does not have this preoccupation unless they have the religious psychosis. I'm gonna read that again. So if the person has a religious preoccupation, it may be demonic because normally a person who is mentally ill does not have this preoccupation unless they have religious psychosis. Another thing to look for, violence or abuse. Does the mental illness cause people to be violent? Does mental illness cause people to be abusive? Yes to both. Generally, when this occurs, it is more demonic than mental illness, particularly if it's related to some trauma or abuse to which they have experienced. Mentally ill people who are violent and abusive don't necessarily have a life history of violence and abuse. When they do, this lends to be more on the demonic side because they are demonized as a result of the trauma and the demonization expresses itself through the violence and the abuse. So those are some, some things that you can look at to try to discern, you know, is this mental illness, is this demonization? You wanna look at family history. You wanna look as the person been institutionalized. You wanna look at the symptoms, are they regular? You want to look and see if they have a religious affiliation, a heavy fixation on religion. And you want to look at, are they violent? Are they abusive? So what are the possibilities? We have one, totally mentally ill. No demons, hormones, biochemistry, something that they have inherited in the brain is just misfiring. It does not work. Now the Christian community does not want to accept this reality because every, everything is a demon to them. But the reality is everything is not a demon, according to Bob Larson. Not every sickness is a demon. Not every sickness <clears throat> is from the devil. But it's not the result of a demonic possession. Sometimes you just get sick. The body malfunctions. Sometimes you don't treat your body right and your body suffers because you have been bad to your body. Same case, sometimes you have been bad to your mind and your mind goes bad. Yes, the devil may have played a part in this, but you're still mentally ill and you don't need an exorcism. You legitimately need treatment, all right? Secondly, mental illness that is caused by demons. It's not biochemical. A demon caused the person to go crazy. Many people in mental institutions today qualify for this classification. They are there because the demons drove them crazy. And if you could work with them, the demon is not there because he is born, he's left them. So number three, demon of mental illness. A demon of mental illness or a demon of insanity, when this spirit is cast out, all the mental illness leaves. There's no biochemical changes have taken place. It was all a manifestation of the spirit and the person is restored to their right mind. These are the people that you want to get and to minister to. You wanna you want to, want to try to find these people because they're terribly afflicted. <clears throat> Another, number four combinations of both. It's truly biochemically, physiologically, and mentally ill, and they also have demons. Which came first? You don't always know. Sometimes they were mentally ill and the demon saw an opportunity, seized it, and they become demonized 
because they were highly vulnerable and defenseless because of the mental aberrations, the abnormalities. In other cases, they became demonized and the demon created legitimate mental illness. It was given to them by the demon. They can implant thoughts of physical or mental illness and you can get that illness. Now there are two challenges because you can get rid of the demon, but the illness doesn't go away. The illness now needs to be healed. So you follow what I'm saying here? And, and a lot of people, they're disappointed because they come in for an exorcism and we get rid of the demon that's there causing it. But there's also the physical manifestation that needs to be taken care of and gotten out of the person. And that is through treatment. And we don't do that. We only do the demon part. You have to seek a licensed medical professional to do the treatment part. Sometimes people who have been afflicted with mental illness, they don't wanna take the medication because they don't like how it makes them feel. They don't want to be participating in treatment programs because it takes up their time. It keeps them from being normal. You know, there's a whole list of reasons why people don't want to do certain things. And you as an exorcism minister need to be aware that sometimes, you know, this, the simplest solution is God's solution. You can wear yourself out. And, and we have done this. We have spent hours upon hours upon hours with one person only to discover that it truly was mental illness that was there. We did get some spirits out of the person, but the overwhelming underlying theme was, was mental illness. And we, you know, in, in one particular case I'm thinking of, we went right back to the very beginning. Every, everything started all over again. And we were like, what's going on here? So when we really started examining it, looking at everything that was there, this person was mentally ill. It's, it's, you have to know when to let go as an exorcism minister. You just, you just have to know that. Number five, last category, demons with periods of insanity. Demons with periods of insanity. Demons come and go. When demons aren't there, there is no indication of mental illness. There is no indication that anything is wrong with the mind. But when the demons are there, they're messed up. King Saul and the depression. So, and a lot of people don't realize this. So sometimes the demons don't stay there the whole time. They're in and out. They're in and out because that person has, uh, you know, has the ability to control and uh, <clears throat> keep those things moving in and out, in and out of them. Or they don't have any control, and the demon demon comes and goes at will. And you have to discern which which is which. So. Some people don't want to deal with any of this. They would rather deny that it happens and not deal with the real problems. This is not easy. This is not cheap. And it definitely is not simple. When someone comes to you with some indication of a mental problem, take a deep breath. Don't go charging into the situation, rebuking and commanding. Get a little more history from the person. Ask some more questions so that you can get into this properly and really effectively help the person. Documentation and history will make this process easier to piece together. This is why taking talking to demons is very important. And there's different viewpoints on this in the church and some people in the church don't want you to talk to them. Sometimes the demons don't wanna to talk to you. <laughs> I've been there, done that. You have to make them talk. Other times they're lying, so you, you just really, it just, it just really takes discernment from God to know exactly what to do and how to do it. There's no simple solution to this. It just, it just really isn't. We don't dialogue with demons just for the sake of dialogue. We dialogue with them to interrogate them. We interrogate them to get into the complexities and find out the root cause of the person's problem. Many times you can force the demon to tell you what, what went on and this is healing because in the post-deliverance process, you know how to get that person restored in aftercare and how to bring about recovery. It's, 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 it's crucial. It's important. There are various forms of mental illness. 
Um, I'm going to give you a few. This is not an all-inclusive list. Um, various forms of mental illness, schizophrenia. You will run into this one the most, Jacqueline Hyde. Two personalities, the person is split down the middle. One thing, one minute, the next thing, the next minute. When people ask me to cast the demons out of a schizophrenic, I take a deep breath and tell them, I don't know if I will cast the demons out of them because they may not have demons. At this point, they're going to get mad and upset because they have determined that this thing is a devil because they want a quick, simple answer. There is no quick, simple answer to this. Schizophrenia is emotionally taxing on the family, but there's no quick, simple answer to this. Sometimes treatment options are drugs. Do they help? Do not ever tell someone to stop their medication. You're not a clinician nor a professional. You could send that person off the edge. You don't know if the only thing that is keeping them in reality is the medication that they're on. Please be careful. You tell them to stop it and you have a basket case and a lawsuit on your hands. Sometimes mental illness is demonically caused, but there are sufficient natural symptoms that can be treated by the drugs. If someone tells me that they're under treatment by drugs, generally this is true mental illness. Don't, drugs don't control demons. Drugs may control symptoms that demons manufacture, but they don't control the demons. Your job is to determine merely what is masking the symptoms of the demon, or is it actually treating the biochemical issue physiologically related to the genuine suffering of the person? So if drugs are involved, it may be a clue that it is not all demonic. So if drugs are involved, it may not be a clue. It may be a clue that everything that's going on with this person is demonic. Psychosis. Psychosis is a loss of contact with reality that usually includes false beliefs about what is taking place or who, it, who one is, delusions, seeing or hearing things that aren't there, hallucinations. Three, misdiagnosis or dissociative identity disorder. Most clinicians don't know how to handle this or they don't want to deal with this because it is time intensive. Neither does it produce the right kind of cash flow. They made a lousy, lazy diagnosis and the person is actually dissociative and the different mental states or different personality alters who are out. And some of those personality alters may have insanity. So the person is flipping around back and forth between these alters, they are dissociative. Dissociative identity disorder, multiple personality disorder can be, can be misdiagnosed as mental illness. Read that again. Dissociative identity order, multiple personality disorder can be misdiagnosed as mental illness. You have an insane alter, one of the alters is crazy, the whole system isn't mentally ill, just that one alter. When that alter is out, the clinician doesn't understand. Separate realities. If you don't understand multiple personality disorders, people can bounce between alters and they're all over the place. They go through many ranges. In the third case, self-abuse. The whole system is not dysfunctional. If you understand the whole person doesn't want to cut just one, personality does. So, so this can get really, really tricky real quick. Bipolar. This used to be called manic depressive. They're up and they're down. Mood swings can be very gentle over time or completely erratic. You never know who is going to come walking through the door. Bob Larson discovered when it's demonization, the manic side and the depressive side, both sides can be demons. One aspect can be biochemical. The other aspect can be demonic. Sometimes both are biochemical. And this can really get complicated. But knowing the history is the key. Depression. There's clinical depression versus spiritual depression. Clinical related to your body. 
Your body's doing strange things. Your thyroid is out of whack. Glandular, hormonal. You should seek competent medical advice, but don't swallow everything that they suggest. At this point, you need a miracle. Spiritual depression. Root cause is generally involved in abuse, trauma, something that has happened to you that you're stuck in and not getting resolved. And you become dissociatively stuck in this altar <clears throat> because down on the inside, the person has trauma and abuse. So the depression is just a symptom of what's going on on the inside. You're not depressed. You have a trauma issue, abuse issue, and a demon is, a demon is stirring this up. Every time the demon stirs this up, you get depressed. Almost always related to a secret. When someone is depressed spiritually, there is something down in the person that no one knows. It may be a hidden altar or amnesia or mask, but it's there. This takes work and the clinical community does not take the resources seriously to deal with this particular situation. In closing, always, always, always remember they need our love also. There are many in the body of Christ who have infirmities of the mind, body, and soul. Does that make them any less of a child of God? No. They still need love. They still need Jesus. They still need to have their basic needs cared for and attended to by the body of Christ. I hope this gives you just a brief overview of what to look for, um, some things to think about. Please comment. Please write your questions in the, uh, in the comment section. If there's anything that you're struggling with, please let us know so that we can be praying for you. This has been Christopher with the Exorcism Team from the Lighthouse Church. Thank you so much. Be blessed. We want to thank you for tuning in to the Lighthouse Church Inc. Exorcism Team discussion. We hope that you're getting a lot out of the teachings. You can always reach out to us through exorcism at lighthousechurchinc.org for any questions or comments or things that you would like for us to teach on. You also can check out our social media pages, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There you are going to find many, many teachings that will help you grow and help you to stay set free, but also help you to become the exorcism minister that God is calling you forth to be. Thank you, and God bless.